Okay, welcome to Rock Docs, a podcast about music documentaries. Uh, this is a very exciting one. Oh, by the way, I'm here with my co-host. <laughs> Andrew Keats. Yeah, and this is David Lizabram. And uh, yeah, we, uh, you've, if you've listened to our show, you know that we are big fans of uh, a little-known documentary called Summer of Soul. <laughs> um, and um, we're thrilled to be joined by a very special guest, Joseph Patel, who is uh, one of the uh, producers of that uh, award-winning film. Say hi, Joseph. Thank you for having me. Hello. <laughs> hi. Um, yeah. Well, we'll uh, we'll jump right into this. Uh, first of all, uh, congratulations on your you know your Oscar and your Grammy and all that good stuff. That's uh, gotta feel good. You probably don't get sick of being told that uh, you know congratulations are being introduced as the Oscar winning, etc. I will never get tired of it. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Andy, let's get into this. Yeah, so I, I, my first question is sort of um, where the movie starts. We we get the the clapper um, where the the title on the on the clapper is uh, Black Woodstock, and I, I guess I'm I'm interested in sort of the the creation of the project or bringing the project to life. Um, how much of it was like was the the framing around? Uh, that original title or that working title, I guess I should say, Black Woodstock. How much of that played into the the sort of conception of the the piece as it came together? Um, you know, I, I, I there's there's like two storylines there. One is, you know, how the film got how, how the film came to be, mm-hmm. which is my two co producers, Robert Fivlint and David Dinnerstein, had. Uh, gotten this the rights to this footage from Hal Tolchin, who shot the festival, um, and uh, and they had been trying to make this film for like fifteen years, I think thereabouts, and um, they, you know, for various reasons, they just weren't finding people who were willing to invest in making this film. I think it's emblematic of the original footage not really finding <clears throat> its proper release you know, back in 69. Um, and they had the very inspired idea of, of getting Questlove to direct this film, someone who's never directed anything before. This would be his first project. Uh, but, you know, Questlove Amir, uh, as I know him, is a natural storyteller. And I think, um, you know, through his music, through his interviews, through his podcast, through his book, he's a storyteller. I thought it was a very inspired idea. And, they uh, brought on board this production company, Radical Media. Um, and um, when Questlove was hired, they approached me to join them, uh, to come on board as a, as a producer of the film. Um, really with the, the idea being I'd be more of a creative producer to work with Amir in telling this story. And, um, you know, I've directed, I've produced before. The head of entertainment at Radical Media is a guy named Dave Sorolnik. Who, I, who used to be my old boss when I worked at MTV. Uh, and I've known Amir for 25 years, 26 years now. I met, We met in 1996 and uh, had been friends ever since. And so that's, that's sort of how the film came together. Um, and the working title of the film at some point was Summer of Soul. I think Robert Fivlink came up with that title many years ago when he was pitching this project. And... When Amir came on board and when I came on board, we discussed the title and we called it Black Woodstock. I think the idea being let's like having black in the title was 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 something that we thought was really bold and and sort of, you know, you often see um, things being claimed from the black community and sort of repurposed for more mainstream consumption and we felt like this was a, a way to reverse that and call it Black Woodstock. Yeah. Uh, we just like the sound of it. And as we, and that was sort of our working title of the film. And I think with a lot of films, both scripted and documentary, you don't really settle on your title till you've made something. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as we were interviewing people from Harlem, people who went to the festival, the thing they kept telling us is that don't call this black Woodstock. Like this is something that happened on its own independent of Woodstock. Um, and, and it should be recognized as such. And, and, and we kept hearing that. And and the more we kept learning about the festival, we realized that was actually the case. So once we had like a fine cut of the film, we went back to the title and started 
coming up with alternate titles. And we came back to Summer of Soul, which on its own feels very soft, I guess. Yeah. But also we looked at the film that we made and, and, and the film, you know, the film sort of started from a place of joy. It was really centered in joy, yeah. black joy. And so we thought, OK, well, Summer of Soul actually makes sense now as a title. But Amir obviously wanted to do something else to it. And, you know, that's why we have the sort of parenthetical and when the revolution would not be televised, which I think is sort of just the, a detail, a very small thing that really carries a lot of significant impact in how the film is presented. It's very Amir. And it's also his sort of tribute to uh, Spike Lee, uh, you know, obviously who's a huge influence on Amir. Um, um, and, and, and yeah, so, I mean, that's, that's sort of how we came, came about it. That's why in the slate, you see Black Woodstock on the slate because when we did those first set of interviews, that was sort of the working title of the film. So, um, Questlove, <laughs> I'm going to call him Questlove because I don't know him personally, unlike yourself. Um, I mean, there's no question that he is a music documentary first ballot Hall of Famer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's we should Andy write that down. We should do mm-hmm. we should do that. But um, uh, yeah, I, uh, uh, this is probably the only documentary that I've ever seen where he is not a talking head. <laughs> right. Um, how how did you guys, um, you know, whether it was him or the production team, everybody working together, decide what his role would be like? Because not only was he a first time director, but he is known for comment commenting about music um, and related topics. So so how did you guys figure that out? I mean, I think, you know, I, I think when the director shows up in a film as a talking head, it's sort of a cheat, right? I think one of the things I'm proud of to see Questlove as my friend um, was his journey as director during this film, right? Like he was understandably very nervous at the start and very, you know, he was just like, just make sure I don't crash this, you know, and, and it's terrible. And it's like, <laughs> you know, and, and really, I, you know, that was, that's a huge responsibility both as his friend and collaborator. And, and we had a really good team. I think that was the thing is like, you know, we had a very strong team making this film um, incredible line producer, Cora Atkinson, incredible associate producer, Ashley Bembry Kaintuck, Dave Sorolnik at Radical Media was an incredible executive. Um, you know, David and Robert had been living with this material for a very long time. Lizzie McGlynn, our archival producer, it was a very strong team. So just the idea of like uh, surrounding him with a lot of people um, who, 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 did, who did good work and, and knew their jobs I think that was key. first first and foremost, that was key. But also we decided very early on, like, you're not going to be in this. The, the, the trick would be to how do you how do we tell this story without you being in this? And, and so we knew he wasn't going to be in it very early on. But that's kind of scary because it is a cheat. Like he could just show up on camera and, and guide the viewer through this. But I think what I'm really proud of is that he illustrated his talent as a director by, by not doing that. And by being able to tell the story through the interviews that we did and through the footage that we found and through the archival footage that we sourced. And, and that's why I was like, you know, you see the result in the, in the film itself. I think, you know, it's a, it's a, it would have been very easy for him to just pop up in there and, and say those things, but it wouldn't have quite the emotional impact that I think that it, that it does. So you mentioned that, you know, talking to attendees of the festival and people from Harlem actually sort of shaped uh, the, the, the framing of the project itself. Um, I mean, they also are some of, besides, besides the am- amazing concert footage, they're some of the most memorable, uh, parts of the film. Um, I'm interested in, in how difficult it was to locate, uh, people. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't that recent. Um, I mean, yeah. I, I think like finding a guy like, um, like Musa Jackson, who has these just incredibly vivid memories from when he was a little kid is such a, such a coup for, for filmmaker. How did you, you know, how did you guys go out and find those folks? I, you know, I'm glad you asked that question. I really love this story because I'm really proud of what we were able to do in finding these, these folks. First, first of all, you know, it, it's 50 years ago is a long time. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and it and you realize that when you sort of cast your first net and it's like, oh, well, we're talking about like two and a half generations. Yeah. And 
it's it's really hard. We, we the first thing we did was put some stuff out on social media. Obviously, Amir has a huge social media reach and didn't really get anything. And you know, at that point, we were like, "Well, this is going to be trickier than we thought." And so, you know, Harlem is a is a place where I think, understandably so, you know, people who have who who live in Harlem and have sort of been born and raised in Harlem, they're not very trusting of the outside communities because nor should they be um you know it's historically have been sort of misrepresented and 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 persecuted to some degree and and just structurally just left out of the conversation of new york city oftentimes historically or exploited when it is mentioned exploited when it is mentioned and 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 so you know we wanted to make sure we had we had to we had to people we approached we had to sort of convince that you know, what, what the project we were doing, why we were doing it, that we had the right motivation. Um, you know, we hit the, we, we put boots on the ground. We, we went and visited some community leaders. We, we made flyers uh, talking about the festival and the film and left them at community centers, churches, social clubs, record stores, um, dance studios, uh, coffee shops, just to, to really just like f- – you know, again, put boots on the ground and really just have a presence and, and, and explain really to people why we were making this film and that what kind of a film it was. And that was a real important part of, of locating people. The other, the Ashley Bembry Kaintuck, our associate producer, um, then met with certain people that we did reach out to who are from the community, who put us in touch with other people. And I, you know, <laughs> God bless Ashley. Like she, you know, when we when we found Bullwhip from the film, uh, who's the Black Panther, mm. he was like, uh, yeah, come meet me. I'm at a community board meeting on Wednesday night. Come meet me. Ashley came to, to meet him and he was like, oh, OK, you showed up. Well, I've got to go. So you should come to the next meeting next week. And so she did. <laughs> and then he's like, oh, well, you know, she comes up to him afterwards and, and, and he was like, oh, well, I'm actually going to go see a bunch of people. I do this uh, ballroom dancing class with a bunch of my friends you should come to that like and she ended up having to go to like one or two classes to and really just spend time with him to to prove that she was not um it wasn't transactional right and and i and i it was just great and then and then we you know there's a couple of people that are really plugged into the community who put us in touch with other people they're like oh yeah this is this thing that my aunt talked about for many years like and then we found musa and musa what we learned after we found musa is that musa's you know, he's born and raised in Harlem and that's, that's his home. He's sort of the unofficial mayor of Harlem. Everyone knows who he is. He represents for Harlem proudly. Um, and, you know, we, we, we located Musa and, and, um, you know, he was <clears throat> five years old when the festival happened. And so we put him on our list and, you know, we had a list of about 40 people that we found. Um, and we did pre-interviews with everybody. And, you know, what you realize about 50 years ago is it's a long time ago. And, and also just like, the, you know, because of age and because of the time that's passed, a lot of people just don't remember um, the way they think they remember, or they remember what they think they should remember and not really what they remember. Right. Yeah. It, it really becomes a really interesting exercise in memory. And, um, and then, so we, so we sort of like take those people off the list and and then we we had a good list of about 15 to 18 people and then we did pre-interviews with those people and and Musa we got to Musa and I was like Ashley just like talk to him see what he knows not I'm not optimistic that we'll 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 get anything from him but you should talk to him and she does and she comes back and she's just like her jaws on the floor and she's just like he remembers everything and she <laughs> she starts recounting some of the details that he he mentioned in their in their pre-interview and it's all the stuff that we're seeing in the footage. In addition, he's describing like vendors around the park and people hanging out the buildings across the street. And these are photos that we had just received from the New York Times that had <laughs> never run. They were photographed. They had never run. We asked them to send us whatever they had in storage. Um, and they did. They just did quick scans of their contact sheets. And so we were seeing this for the first time and really no one else had seen them since they were taken. And Moose is describing exactly what we're seeing in the photos. He remembers, ex- he remembers exactly what the fifth dimension are wearing, what songs they played, the fact that they passed out balloons on the side of the stage, all stuff in the footage that he wouldn't have seen. Yeah. And, 
And there was some footage that was leaked on YouTube from Sly and Nina, but like not the fifth dimension. And, and so I was just like in awe. I was like, okay, we brought him in for the interview. He was, I think on our first day of interviews and he tells us all the details that he's, he told Ashley on the phone and he's, you know, he's sort of like, you can see his face lighting up. He's held on to this memory in such vivid detail for such a long time. And at the end of the interview, we're like, let's show him the footage. And, and I said, keep the cameras running. And Amir and I are just sitting there in the room along with everybody else. And he starts crying. He sees the footage and he starts crying. It elicits this like very specific emotional reaction out of him. And you see it in the film. It bookends the film. And it's just like... It, it was an aha moment for us as filmmakers because what we realized is not this material, it's more than just a, a, a story. It's, it really has this emotional, visceral, emotional connection with people. And, and really that's, we, you know, we didn't have plans to show him the footage. I, I was going to show him the footage. We didn't have plans to do it on camera. Yeah. Um, Amir was like, yeah, let's, let's show him the footage. And that's why his shot is actually not very framed very well. Cause it's the first interview and and we showed it to him and you know the shots sort of like a little janky in the background um but maybe but, but that, the but the footage is it glows on his face you yeah, know, it, yeah it illuminates his face just in time to see the the nuances of his facial reaction so you yeah know, if it's not framed perfectly it still works perfectly you know? it works perfectly and 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 in later interviews we decided to show everyone the footage and it's mm. it's it really just was like you know i think it's it's really what for us in making the film it became sort of our North star is what we realized is it was an emotional story for people, a personal story, not just a historical one. And um, Marilyn McCoo, same thing, you know, she, they're watching yeah. the footage, you see their emotions and um, you know, even Chris Rock who makes a brief appearance in the film, like, you know, we had interviewed him about comedy stuff that was part of the festival that didn't make it in the film, but you know, I wanted to show him some other stuff as well. And I showed him Stevie wonder. That's why he, he comments on Stevie wonder. And it's, it's just like everyone we showed the footage to after their interviews, they were just like, wow. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's a pretty cool thing, but finding people who went to the festival was, you know, it was, it was not easy. It was actually took many months to find people and find the right people. Yeah. I, I would say the, um, one thing that jumped out at me is the technique of showing people the footage and showing their reaction live is like, it's, it's, it's I mean, I don't, you know, it, it was genius. I mean, it, it was really the kind of thing. It's like, why doesn't every music documentary do this? And they probably should all from now on, you know, because, right. <laughs> you know, any musician or person who was involved with something related to music or, you know, I mean, it could be anything, but specifically music, um, you know, that's, I would just love to see that in every, you know, music documentary going forward. And you mentioned Marilyn McCoo. I mean, that is particularly a moment or a piece of the film that stood out to me. Cause when I heard about the movie, I was like, ah, this is gonna be great. You got Sly and the Family Stone, you got Gladys Knight, you got, you know, people that I, you know, already had a big attachment to Stevie Wonder, Nina Simone. But when the fifth dimension come on, like, I mean, I remember their music from like playing in my mom's car when I was a kid. But I don't, you know, have that much of a connection with them. I couldn't have told you a lot about them. And it was like after five minutes of the film, I was like a fan. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, yeah. Um, it, you know, and it, it, I'm wondering what, what, whether there was um, an attempt to kind of highlight or bring out um, some of the artists that maybe, whether it's gospel, whether it's the fifth dimension, that, that aren't as big of a headline today in terms of like music fans that you don't hear a lot about. I mean, I think the fifth dimension is, is, is the best one, right? I think, you know, for me, I know Marilyn McCoo from solid gold, right? Yeah, sure. That's what I, that's how I know her is I grew up on, I grew up watching solid gold and the fifth dimension in 1969 are the biggest artists in the country. They're, they're, they're Dua Lipa and Drake in one, <laughs> right? And, and they have the biggest song of the year. And, you know, and this is again, a thing that I think Amir brings to the, film as a director that maybe someone else couldn't bring is you know one of the reasons we wanted to speak to the fifth dimension was um because you know amir talks about this thing about code switching as a black artist they have they 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 operate one way in a in a room most filled with mostly white folks and they operate a different way in a room filled with mostly black folks and so 
<clears throat> and and that code switching is something that the fifth dimension know a lot about because they had a sound that people described as a white sound. They had a very pop sound at the time when a, <clears throat> a lot of black artists aren't doing that sound. And um and and he wondered his his question and how it started was I you know you see how they are on like the Dick Cavett show or whatever the show was at the time, the white show at the time. He's like, I wonder how they felt about playing in Harlem. And what we discovered in interviewing them is that that was the first time they played Harlem. That's actually part of what we learned from the footage and, and what it felt like to play Harlem for them. And that's how that story unfolds. And not only was it their first time playing in Harlem, but it was so important to them for those reasons that, Maybe on the surface, when we have the film on sort of paper, we didn't realize was an important thing. But when you talk to him in the room and then you show him the footage, it's like, oh, again, the process of these interviews really revealed how emotional this event was to the people that were there and the people that were performing. And I think that's where the the, the emotional feeling and the emotional substance of the film comes from. I sort of got a similar sense with uh, Sly as well. That um, coming from San Francisco, he has this you know history as a psychedelic DJ. Um, there's white band members, um, and I, I can't remember the audience member who mentions that you know he he was a Motown guy. He wanted to wear a suit and, and be all buttoned up, and then all of a sudden he saw Sly, and everything changed for for him and his his boys from then on out. Yeah, Daryl um, Lewis. Daryl Lewis. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah. That, his uh, his story is a good one. Um, it, you know, it, it, do you th- was that uh, consciously there with with Sly as well? The the sort of uh, I guess what I would say in general is like the the extent to which there. W- people who didn't fit tidily into the segregated nature of popular music at the time. Yeah. I mean, Sly, you know, I think Sly as a band in 69 looked like they're from the future, right? (laughs) Precisely for the reasons that Daryl describes is, and Greg describes it and a couple other people describe it as like, they are not wearing suits. Like you're conditioned to think that uh, groups like that should be doing um, because of Motown. At one point, Sly and the Family Stone did wear suits and things like that when they first started out. Um, they are mixed gender. They are mixed race. And and you just did not see that, especially in New York. So Sly landing in Harlem looked like they were aliens, right? Um, and what's interesting about Sly is that, you know, that, that's, that summer is such a transformative summer for, for the band is they, you know, basically... They played Harlem uh, on on June twenty. When did Man Land on the Moon? Was it the twentieth or twenty seventh? They play Harlem the day Man Lands on the Moon. They played at the Apollo Theater with Red Fox opening, and that moon landing scene in the in in Summer of Soul is from the lobby of some of the people that the MOS the Man on the Street interviews are from the lobby of the Apollo that mm-hmm. night. And Sly is the headliner at the Apollo that night. They play the Harlem Cultural Festival a couple weeks later, unannounced. They're not on the bill. They were just rolling through town. They wanted to play. Um, and then they they go across the eastern seaboard, and then the summer culminates in Woodstock, where they have, they're have they fine-tuned at that point, and they play the performance of their life. And... Um, and, and their Woodstock triumph, you know, makes them the biggest band in the country at that point. And it really is interesting because with Sly, it's so generational, right? There's like, I always thought, you know, there's a moment when uh, David Ruffin comes out yeah. and he, and he, he says, I'm going to do the oldies and he, and he, and he does my girl. And it's like, that song is five years old, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. but there's such a shift happening musically right. and culturally that even he recognizes that his five-year-old hit with the temptations is not the future. It's not, it's not even the present. And I think Sly shows up on that stage and, you know, like, like Greg Rico says in the film, people are a little skeptical, but you know, it's hard to listen to that music and and not feel like that is exciting and not be excited by it. So I think in a lot of ways, Sly, um, you know, again, just defies convention on every front visually, aesthetically, musically, and show up on that stage to a mostly black audience and, win them over i uh would love to know more about tony lawrence 
Um, he, you Me know, too. He, <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> go make another documentary. Um, he, uh, you know, he's just, you know, the announcer uh, slash host, and he's like, seems perfectly comfortable schmoozing with Jesse Jackson and Mayor Lindsay and all these other people. And, you know, I never heard him before I love, this. I love when Mayor Lindsay turns to walk away and Tony just like, grabs him like <laughs> like yanks him over to him it's so yeah. good i feel like tony lawrence like I, I i you know it's funny in the whole rollout of the film and and all the press around it like you know obviously people focus on the footage and 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 this footage that had, had largely been unseen and 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 that's cool but for me it was always the event right it's always the event itself and tony lawrence is responsible for the event itself it is you know he had started the harlem cultural festival in 67 which was essentially a block party in 68, it's at Mount Morris Park, but not nearly as big. In 69, you know, the city got behind it. Health Hulchin decides to film it. The si- Maxwell House comes on board. He, he, t- Tony finally has a budget to book real headlining acts. And he does a great job with it. And, and, and Tony, I think, you know, a, a lot of people might recognize someone like Tony in their lives or in their community. Um, a hustler, but in a good way someone who is able to take your sort of like to sort of wear you down with, with, with their persistence. Right. And to take your sort of like half commitment concession and really flip that into like a real commitment, you know, from multiple people. It's like, it's such a, it's such a talent and it's such a um, unique skill set that, that he really, he triumphed in making that festival happen uh, because of that you know there's a photo of him with rfk and there's like it's just like he just was that guy in that space and you know we did a lot of research and try to track him down and 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 if he had any family and and we just kept hitting dead ends like he just disappears at some point in the mid 70s and um you know i think the last mention we saw of him in a newspaper was in the new amsterdam news at Sarah Vaughn's funeral in the late seventies. Mm-hmm. And, and that's it. Then we really don't know what happens to him. Now, since the film came out, I thought maybe more people might come out of the woodwork to say, Oh, I know what happened to Tony. I knew him in the eighties or whatever. Nobody did. Wow. So I don't, I, I really, that is one of the things that I really want to know. The people that we spoke to who knew him at the time described him as someone who if he didn't want to be found would not be found (laughs) and so it feels like at some point something happened in his life where he felt you know i think i think part of the residual uh uh after effects of um of the festival not of how told not selling that footage is i think tony thought there was going to be money to put on more festivals um that was his his hope and his, his his intent um, and then when Hal wasn't able to sell those festivals the way he wanted them to, um, that idea of doing more festivals all around the country sort of got put on hold. So um, I, I've, I, I would love to know at some point in time just what happened to him. Yeah. Uh, David and I, when we did the, an episode breaking down like a deep dive onto uh, into the movie, we talked about um, there sort of being – um, this like noticeable absence of uh, of one very high profile uh, black performer at the time, Jimi Hendrix, and um, there's reports I've read that that he was actually playing clubs in Harlem around the time of the of the um, festival. Uh, I was curious, did you guys talk to anybody who had any uh, firsthand experience with that, or was you know any any footage or recordings of that survive? Um. I don't know. Like, you know, Amir swears that he, I, you know, Amir swears that he, Jimmy would, was approached to play the festival. Hmm. I don't know where he got that from. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It makes sense that he would have been approached, I guess, Uh, because he was playing, he had a, he had a, a girlfriend in Harlem and he was playing a lot of clubs around there and bopping around. And uh, it makes sense that he would, I you know I don't think the festival was afraid to have him on the on on the bill because uh, you know obviously they had other it was a full range of of diverse acts on that bill um, he wouldn't have been at a place next to Sonny Chirac for example yeah um, but I don't know I don't know why he never played or if he was even approached I w- I would assume that he might have been and just it didn't happen 
Um, I did track down someone in his band at some point um, and just to see if they they were at the festival. Um, and he, he said he, that whole summer was just a drug-fueled <laughs> stupor. So he has no idea. Um, yeah. He swears that he played... He saw Nina Simone in the park, but he also that was the day they played Woodstock. So there's not it's not possible. Right. Yeah. So um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. It would have been it's, it's sort of like the two missing headliners of the era would have been James Brown and Jimi Hendrix. But yeah. and what's you know, Jimi Hendrix plays a block party in Harlem a month later in mm-hmm. September. At the end of September, he plays a block party, which I believe no footage exists of that. But there is photos um there are photos um but yeah it's it would have been cool if he if he was on the bill somehow uh the one thing andy and i always want when we talk about music documentaries is we always want more (laughs) um you know i mean we're spoiled now with you know genius the kanye you know doc that we loved get back obviously you know this like eight hour epic um i mean i think this works great as a two-hour movie you know and obviously the world agrees (laughs) so um you know no no knock on that but just was there ever any talk of you know i'm sure you've got tons more musical footage and things like that was there talk of doing something longer making it a series is there any talk of expanding it at all in the future or is this just like or or is it a rights thing you know just kind of curious about that um yeah you know it's funny i i think you know i think people because of the success of the film it's hard to it's it's easy to overlook sometimes that it really took a lot to get, even get this made right like it was a lot uh, many years and many people saying no and not not and it really it wasn't until 2018 when you know after many years of searching all the investors sort of came together mm-hmm. and 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 were able to fund this movie obviously there's a lot of licensing involved and a lot of archival involved um, and. And so, you know, it was enough just to make this movie. No one wanted it as a series. <laughs> no one wanted it as anything. We very creatively, very early on as a team, really was like, okay, um, you know, this could be a concert film. But we, you know, we very early on, we looked at what else was happening in New York that summer, in the country that summer. And we realized that it would be a disservice if we just made it a concert film to all the stories happening. It's a really just a moment of transition in the community and in the country that it's just, it's just to storytellers. It's very exciting to be able to the challenge of being able to have a music documentary that also told a story that that for us was the challenge and, and that it really excited us now that it's been made and it's had success. I really do hope this other footage comes out mm-hmm. because, you know, I think we've shown that people have an appetite for it and, and my hope is that it will come out in some way, shape, or form um, in the future. I think uh, Robert and David, the two co-producers, you know, have the footage, and I think it's just a matter of what is that, what is that, what does that look like, right? I, it's not a sequel. It's is it something else? Is it an expanded edition? I know Amir is, you know, he's such a Criterion junkie that, like, you know, I think he was talking about the criterion edition after the rough cut of the film, <laughs> he was like, oh, well, we'll save this. you know, as we're cutting things, he's like, Oh, we'll put that in the criterion edition. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm hopeful that, that some more of this will come out in some way, shape or form. Fantastic. Uh, that's all I got for you, man. That's uh, a heck of a movie. I've been, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm here for all of the expanded releases you got. Uh, um, sounds, sounds like uh, Questlove is, uh, is, continuing down this path with a uh, sly movie we all be yeah. for that yeah. yeah we just started on that about three weeks ago four weeks ago you really just you just you just got going on that huh yeah yeah i think i mean the award season sort of took out you know it, we, there's not a lot we could have done in that in that time so we started really in earnest about three four weeks ago um, and so my understanding of the, the story behind that is that you sort of uh some of the connections and the um opportunities for, for some of that footage grew out of summer of soul connections you guys made with them with the family and that sort of thing is that not right Mm, no i think uh one of the product the uh, different production companies involved in this film than than on summer of soul they had been working on a sly project 
uh, based on an interview they did with him in 2017 and they mm-hmm. had his life rights. And uh, after summer of soul, actually even before we finished summer of soul, but right after Sundance, they had signed on Amir as a, as the director of the slide project. And, you know, I think that everyone saw summer of soul and said, Oh yeah, right. He's, he can direct. Um, and, and so, and then, and then once he got signed on, I came on board that project as well. So, um, you know, we, he's got a really, you know, I think the thing Amir and I share is that we, we just don't want to do things the way that you always see them. And so we spent, a, we spent a lot of time during award season before we technically started working on the film, talking about what kind of a documentary we want to make. And, you know, I, I don't know where we'll end up, but we certainly are starting from a place of we want this to be unlike your traditional music bio doc. Um, the challenge with Sly is it could be a 10 hour series <laughs> and and we're, we're trying to make a two hour film. The other challenge with Sly is that I think there are, he has made such an impact on people worldwide um, that everyone has their sort of version of Sly and the things that they want to see in this documentary. And, and our challenge is how do we tell the story that we want to tell without disappointing people? Um, you know, I think we rose to that challenge with Summer of Soul, and I, I, I hope we can rise to it again. The hilarious thing is, you know, I started out as a music journalist, mm-hmm. and that's how I met Amir. My, my first cover story as a music journalist was on The Roots, and it was their first cover story as a band. Uh, for Rap Pages magazine in 1996. And it was, it's funny because I look at all these interviews I did with artists back then and like, you know, when their second album wasn't as good as their debut or at least it, it, it wasn't perceived <laughs> to be as good as their debut. I was like, well, why is this so different? Right? Like, and it's like, and it's like, it's kind of funny because like now all these years later, it's like, I understand how dumb those questions were <laughs> yeah <laughs> because you can't you can't make the same thing again it's a whole different set of circumstances a whole different material it's a different subject matter it's like you know so Amir and I we we, we talk about like f- famous or like or like well-received second albums after really strong debuts and and we just start talking about that stuff and it's it's really funny because um, I have a lot of sympathy now for all those artists I pestered many years ago about, <laughs> about why why the second album wasn't as good as the first album. So. Um, so yeah, before we let you go, I just have to ask: in terms of the you know music documentaries you mentioned, not wanting to be like what had done before, or whatever, are there um, just putting you on the spot? Are there other music documentaries that you really have an affection for? You really you know that or that stood out to you while you guys were making this one that you kind of wanted to refer to or, or think about? Didn't watch anything. And this is the other thing, right? It's like, I didn't watch anything while making this film, uh, while making Summer of Soul. Uh, but I, I really loved the creativity and the energy of the Sparks documentary. Oh, yeah. Uh, that, like, it, you know, what's, which I didn't see until Sundance. We did a panel with uh, Edgar Wright and his team. And, and so in advance of that panel at Sundance of, of 2021, we watched the Sparks film and we got a screener of it and we watched it. And it was just like, I actually am a music junkie. I don't, I didn't, I wasn't very familiar with Sparks at all. And, and it really just was like this really super creative presentation of this story and really fun. And, and the documentary takes on the personality of the artist, right. In a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And, and so that was really, that was something I put down really early in, in this process of just like a music documentary that breaks the forum and that really, I was really, I really liked. Um, yeah. And I don't know if there's other ones I can reference because I think I like different music documentaries for different reasons. Um, I just know that like in, do- in terms of documentaries, I want, I think we want to be able to tell the Sly story in a d- more creative way, but also to tell a b- bigger story than just the Sly story. I think that's, Amir has a very, I don't want to reveal it on uh, so early, <laughs> but Amir has this thesis for the film that it is just really cool. It's really inspired and really smart and really uh, personal to him. So I think, um, yeah, I'm really excited to, 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 to continue the journey on that film and see where we land. Well, to say we're excited for that would be 
uh, an understatement. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I right. Fast, fastball right down the middle um, for us. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for your time and for coming on. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for having me. I know you're, you know, busy trying to polish your Oscars and <laughs> Grammys and all that <laughs> stuff, but <laughs> I know uh, we really do appreciate it. Um, you are uh, Jazz Beasy on Twitter uh, and uh, you are a good follow on Twitter, I will say. So uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, yeah, and um, we are at Rock Docs Pod on Twitter uh, for people who want to yell at us about stuff. And um, yeah, thank you guys for uh, thanks for coming on, and uh, thanks to folks yeah, for, thanks uh, for listening. For, thanks to, for uh, making a Stone Cold Classic. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me, and thanks for the love. Mm-hmm. Awesome. All right. Uh, yeah, that was Rock Docs. <laughs> <laughs>